In this episode of American Greed, a reality TV couple has a real life come down when they are accused of scamming thousands of unsuspecting victims. The couple is accused of luring people with false promises. They wanted to be a celebrity couple. LaShonda and Marlon Moore say they want to help African-American communities build generational wealth. They call it affinity fraud. $33 million circulated. They use religion. We are two God-fearing individuals. They know the buzzwords, building black wealth. Blessings. More people are going to continue to be blessed out. The Moors use Zoom and other video platforms to sell their scheme and recruit members nationwide for their online investment community called Blessings in No Time, aka Bint. What's up, Bint family? What's up, Bint family? They created this Blessings Circle under the guise of Blessings for Black People. The Moors preach rapid bid returns of biblical proportions and a money-back guarantee. This is a very confusing and convoluted structure. The FTC says Bint is an old-school fraud. Greed is like the venom of a snake. With a modern spin that the Moors hype as totally legit. It's always and still will be Bint! Rashida, how you guys doing? Jasmine, Tanisha, Sarah, Nicole, John, Gloria, Leslie. Nashonda and Marlon Moore are running a live online recruitment meeting, inviting new members into the investment community they call BINT, short for Blessings in No Time. I thought that they were a young, nice couple just trying to help out the community. New members are impressed by the Moore's cachet. As entertainers and media entrepreneurs, they seem to be models of fine living, success, and giving back to the community. You're working progress just like me. They was on the own show, and he was on 106 and Park. The Moors promise a $1,400 investment into Bint will yield a quick return of more than $11,000. And at the height of the pandemic, Bent spreads almost as fast as the coronavirus itself. My aunt called me from Texas, telling me about this group that's so fascinating. But there's trouble ahead. Investors are having difficulty getting their money out. And the Moors put the blame on them. Why is it taking so long? If I gotta be honest, it's because of y'all. They're berating people. And that's when you know that it's starting to fall apart. And LaShonda and Marlon may have to face the music. He just knew how to play the perfect songs at the perfect time, and he would come alive on the mic. Born in Shreveport, Louisiana, Marlon DeAndre Maiden later changes his last name to Moore and comes to fame in Dallas in the early 2010s as DJ ASAP. Marlon selects ASAP as a moniker for his self-adopted mantra, always serve a purpose, and lands a four-year run on the popular BET Music Countdown show, 106 and Park. That put him on the map. His star, like, just skyrocketed. Roderick Pullum buys his first camera around the same time Marlon picks up his turntables and says Marlon's DJ ASAP career takes off from a master mix of hustle and flow. If the party's over, he was down on the corner passing out his mix CDs, and yeah, that's how he made it all the way to BET. There was no, like, celebrity or, like, rock star of the whole game, so that's what I really wanted to try to focus on, that celebrity, rock star type of DJ vibe. A celebrity DJ is, you're one of those people that the celebrities themselves call when they have a party or an event. Celebrity DJ also mean the price tag. Videographer Jarvis Minton strikes a bond with Marlon in 2015 and documents his transition from a DJ promoting brands to ASAP the Mogul as Marlon spent his hustle toward his new nonprofit lifestyle accelerator called Mogul behavior. 
That's where he was branding himself from. Just people thinking that all he was was a DJ. He wanted people to know, like, I'm a businessman. Let's talk about something that's really bringing in the dollar signs. Marlon also flexes a suddenly strong interest in staying fit. He started acting funny, like working out all the time, <laughs> you know? According to Minton, Marlon works out to impress LaShonda Stemile Conley, a single mother of two from Conway, Arkansas, with a background in insurance adjusting and real estate. My thing was, I'm gonna make sure he liked me more than I like him. She was just a gem, man. She had his focus, and I could just always tell that she was gonna be the one for him. I take her to the club, we talking and everything, and <laughs> she was like, you know, you're gonna fall in love. I'm gonna make you fall in love with me. Together, they just created, like, this superpower couple. They wanted to be a celebrity couple. When it was time for business, it was time for business, and she was, like, that stone-cold businesswoman that was like, I'm gonna get my money. If I'm pissed off, you gonna feel it. Oh, she got a mouth on her. Now, with Marlon by her side, Lashonda joins him as a lifestyle guru for mogul behavior and brings her insurance and real estate skills to the table. We do financial planning. We help, you know, insurance as far as also real estate and financing, getting help people get homes and different bank financing as well. Financial wealth and credit. Yeah. LaShonda and Marlon announce their engagement in October 2018 and go over the top for their photo shoot, capturing the attention of casting agents for Family or Fiancé, a reality TV series on the Oprah Winfrey Network. We had to go out to California and stay in a beautiful mansion with our family. So it was about three weeks before we got married, mm -hmm. so we basically had to sit down and just hash everything out. This weekend was hard. Despite a bit of primetime drama, on August 9th, 2019, LaShonda and Marlon's lavish wedding ceremony goes off without a hitch, and Culture Map Dallas calls it the party of the decade. I'm looking for ASAP. As soon as I walk in, all I see is his tux hanging up. And you look on the inside, and the whole inside was just like pictures from the engagement shoot of him and LaShonda on it. In this episode of American Greed, when COVID first hits, the U.S. government opens the money spigot. Today, I will sign the single biggest economic relief package in American history. But that package leads to what is quite possibly the largest fraud in American history. Estimates start around $100 billion. A staggering amount of COVID relief money disappears into the hands of criminals. The fraudsters are bold, buying luxury cars, flights on private jets, mansions. And in the crowd of crooks, one swindler stands out. Richard Avazian runs a family fraud factory designed to steal millions in COVID cash to spend on houses, watches, and gold. You know, in a crisis, most of us turn to each other, and there are some of us that turn on each other. It was cruel to their fellow Americans, people who actually needed that money to survive. American Greed goes inside the assembly line of fraud, inside the Avazian's mansion. It was what they called at trial their dream house. Inside their private conversations. She's not saying that because mom and dad are coming over for dinner. There's an intent behind that and inside the decision to leave their children and run. Richard tries to justify it as if he had no choice, but he had a choice. They chose to commit fraud. They chose to steal money. And they choose their place on the FBI's notorious list, Most Wanted. Over 16,000 now dead across America. New York alone with more cases than any country in the world. Looking back to the spring of 2020 is painful. We are just discovering what COVID-19 can mean. Hospitals are overflowing. ICUs are running out of ventilators. More than 100,000 Americans have died. Entire cities are shut down. 
Tens of millions of Americans are suddenly without work. And for some, that spells opportunity. In Tarzana, California, in his $3 million mansion, Richard Avazian is thrilled with the COVID cash he is raking in. He sends a text to his sister-in-law, Tammy Dodgian. Babe, I got the funds. I just checked the accounts. Already a convicted felon, Richard is leading his family on a criminal joyride. How much they send you, Tammy asks. Like over 500 so far. It will later become clear that Richard is firmly dedicated to one principle. You will never be caught. Richard Avazian's story begins in Yerevan, Armenia, at a time when the Soviets still rule. When he is 10 years old, his mother brings Richard and his brother to America to start a new life, leaving behind his abusive father. They set up life in the Los Angeles area, where for years, Armenian immigrants find a welcoming landing spot. When he came over to the United States, he did not speak any English. He started in the fifth grade, and he learned how to assimilate into the United States culture, and he loved it. And in the country he loves, he finds the love of his life. Her name is Marietta Tarabellian. They are married in 2004 and have two sons and a daughter. One of the things that he said is that he really wanted to be the father that he never had. He wanted to be the father that was going to be there, be a provider, and be a role model for his children. Yes, he will be a role model. A role model for turning a crisis into a chance to steal. In 2007, Richard Avazian's cunning business strategy starts to become clear. He is working in real estate. At the time, easy to get subprime mortgages are flooding the country. So Richard sees an opportunity. He knows the real estate market. He knows how to work the system in order to get the money out of it. It is time to try his hand at bank fraud. He knows many banks are not verifying income and so, on an application for a home equity line of credit, he gives his a boost, from $6,000 a month up to $44,000. Bingo. The loan is approved. Richard gets a half a million dollars. And so next, Marietta gets in on the game. This time, they use her as the borrower, and she inflates her income, and at the time, she was making zero to none. And using the false W-2s and the false tax returns, she gets over a million dollars, just like that. But unfortunately for them, the couple that steals together gets indicted together on charges of bank fraud. Five months later, Richard and Marietta plead guilty. And Richard writes to the sentencing judge asking to avoid jail time. He says that he is most afraid of being separated from his family, the most important people in my life. I will never in the future do anything to cause them pain. It works. The judge believes him. And the court took a flyer on him and said, OK, I'm going to make you do community service. I won't take you from your family, and I hope you learn from this. But the lesson Richard and Marietta learn, crime pays. Eight years after their felony convictions, Richard and Marietta are living in a multi-million dollar house in Encino. Presumably, they can afford it because Richard is a success, working in a number of seemingly legitimate businesses. Richard Avazian presented himself to the world as a serial entrepreneur and angel investor who was interested primarily in the tech industry. But appearances can be deceiving. Evidence shows that despite their previous convictions, Richard and Marietta actually expand and refine their mortgage fraud operation. They had essentially a well-oiled machine to commit fraud. We call it the assembly line of fraud. 
That assembly line is comprised of a huge array of stolen identities, falsified documents, and bank accounts created for one purpose, to steal millions of dollars in loans they never intend to pay back. Just a few blocks away are their co-conspirators, Richard's brother, Arthur, and his sister-in-law, Tammy Dadian. This is a criminal enterprise that is all in the family. Not only do they have the relationships that most American families have with their spouses or with their brothers or sisters or brother and sister-in-laws, but here they're all partners in crime. And this was a family business and that business was fraud. And their best business opportunity is about to fall into their laps. In this episode of American Greed, the $81 billion business of mass incarceration, and how head of prisons Chris Epps makes a killing in the lock em up state of Mississippi. Errol Berry has been a career criminal. He's normal, playful, and joyful, and likes to crack a lot of jokes. He's not doing a lot of joking today. What he controlled was just amazing. What Epps controls as the state's prison commissioner is a $350 million a year gold mine. Chris Epps gives. If Epps say a person should get this contract, he would. And takes. Like, he deserved to wear a Rolex watch. He deserved to drive a Mercedes Benz. Condos down on the Gulf Coast. Why would one business partner be paying another business partner's home mortgage? That's not out of the goodness of your heart. That's not an accident. Because Chris Epps knows everything from a bag of chips to a phone call home has a price tag. All of these services businesses are competing for, and they're worth a lot of money. And he's running one of the largest pay-to-play schemes in Mississippi history. Chris Epps touched everything, and it turned out almost everything Chris Epps touched was corrupt. Chris Epps likes to say he's the tallest hog at the trough. At some point, we reminded him that hog is typically the first to get slaughtered. At the FBI office in Jackson, Mississippi, the feds have called a friendly meeting with prison commissioner Christopher Epps, head honcho of the Mississippi Department of Corrections. We came up with the scenario to get him to come meet. He's used to going to meetings with public figures. He didn't necessarily think that something was wrong. Our initial interaction was very friendly, and then we just wanted him to see something real quick. Because today's gathering is, in fact, a carefully constructed ruse. For months, the feds have been tapping his phone and collecting undercover video. The results of those efforts are queued up on the video screen and ready to roll. And now they tighten the screws. We hit play. And that was enough for him to go, oh, no. <laughs> we have video of those who had been paying the kickbacks to Mr. Epps handing him cash and having Mr. Epps just flip through the cash. It was routine appearing. He appeared to be visibly upset. And when I say upset, perspiring, shaking. There's no better persuasion tool than a video recording. He's not a good guy at this point. No matter what you may have thought of him prior to this, he's been on the take for the last seven to eight years. This is a story about the big business of locking people up. There's not a day go by that just don't cross my mind several, several, several times. And how it made Chris Epps very powerful and rich. To understand Chris Epps, it helps to understand where he came from. Epps' life would have been seen as almost uh, an American success story. I mean, he grew up in the poorest county in America, Holmes County, Mississippi. Raised on his grandparents' farm, Epps recalls pulling turnips and feeding chickens each morning before school. 
He applies that same hard work ethic to earn his degree in education before he takes a job with the Mississippi Department of Corrections. He begins at the bottom, a lowly guard. Epps has said in the past that he was at first terrified of being around so many felons, and with good reason. The state penitentiary known as Parchman has been notorious since 1901. Established more for profit than rehabilitation, according to Jerry Mitchell, a journalist and MacArthur genius who has investigated Mississippi prisons for years. Parchman was a plantation they essentially converted into a prison with the inmates working the fields. And by the way, they didn't just work their fields, they would dole them out to basically plantations around there. In other words, it's a for-profit scheme. They had these inmates working at the cotton fields from sunup to sundown, and the state was just raking in the money from this, and they could whip them, and they actually used that whip up, up until the 70s, which is hard to believe, but it's true. In 1972, the federal court reminds Mississippi that slavery is over and forces it to abandon its plantation-era policies. But in Mississippi, reform is a hard road to hoe. Once prisons began to cost money, Mississippi didn't in turn really want to fund these prisons, so you had really horrible conditions. Civil lawsuits on behalf of inmates cite sewage backups, extreme isolation, and dehumanizing conditions. And they just up and put us in here, man. Look at the flow. Man. All the water in the flow, man. Yeah. Ain't no running water, mildew everywhere. Paint coming out of the wall, bro. Oh, yeah. Black mold, man. That's, that's black mold. Dawn, she asks that we use only her first name, has a husband who has served time at Parchment since 1998. She says in the summer, temperatures inside the prison hit 100 degrees or more and you watch the older inmates, regardless of their crime, you just watch them one by one just kind of die off because they can't take the heat. Parchman, I believe, is pretty much the worst of the worst. Climbing the ranks to head of security at Parchman, Epps witnesses these transgressions and more. He saw the inmates hungry, fighting mad. He saw the sewers backed up. He saw the leaking roofs. So he came from knowledge. The abuses are as commonplace as they are shocking. Mississippi became one of the first prisons in the United States to have conjugal visits. Is it a humanitarian reform, allowing inmates to connect with their loved ones? Not exactly. It's a money-making scheme that turns guards into pimps. The uh, correctional officers had someone type up the dummy marriage certificates and brought in prostitutes. And then the guards, of course, were getting a cut of this. Mitchell's sources suggest that Parchman's culture of corruption twisted Epps's moral compass. I've talked to people who were in prison, inmates in prison in the 1970s at Parchman, and they told me Chris Epps was corrupt way back then. It was something that had been going on the whole time. But Epps has learned how things work in the Mississippi prison system, and he has a knack for politics. He flies through the ranks collecting a string of awards, says former Mississippi Attorney General Jim Hood. He was in the National Guard. He served our state and our country. He was the president of the American Corrections Association. And, you know, you love to see somebody come up and run an agency that started at the bottom. Jimmy Gage covered state politics as a journalist for the Clarion Ledger in Jackson. This man was unique in a sense with his folksy style. You know, most everybody liked the Chris Epps. You know, he was loved on, in the black community. You know, he, he was loved in the white community, you know, at that time. I think he saw himself as being a public official, you know, maybe a, a, maybe even governor one day. In 2002, Epps is tapped for the number one post at the MDOC, Commissioner of Corrections. In this American Greed special, 
This is such a wild story. The unsolved double murder of a prominent attorney's wife and son is making new headlines. An unprecedented tale of small town power. You had a problem, they can make it go away, but then you owed them. And big time greed. Alex preyed on his victims who were his clients, they're right in front of him. For a century, the Murdochs, a powerful family of lawyers and prosecutors, hold a tight grip over a large swath of South Carolina. You didn't want to be on the other end of what they were working on. But behind the aura of respectability, prosecutors say Alec Murdoch is hiding a trove of devious schemes worth nearly $20 million. Have you ever heard of a case where the defendant and the plaintiff's lawyer get together and say, we're going to take all the money. Prosecutors say his crimes extended to an eight-year money laundering and painkiller ring. For years, Murdoch seems untouchable. But when tragedy strikes, his alleged crimes come out of the dark. He never looked like the type of person that would do something of this nature. And into the light. It's yet another twist in a stunning series of events devastating the well-known family. And the once powerful attorney finds himself linked to death. My girlfriend, go, folks! After death. She's cracked her head and there's blood on the concrete. After death. My wife and child is just so badly. Now Murdoch's victims and those who face off with him in court Take American Greed inside the story that's almost impossible to believe. This is a John Grisham work of nonfiction. You cannot make any of this up because it's all true. In the early morning hours, in the misty winter dark, security cameras roll as 19-year-old Paul Murdoch emerges from a boat, saddles up to a bar, and quickly downs two shots. The son of Alec Murdoch, a prominent attorney from a powerful legal dynasty based in Hampton, South Carolina, Paul is used to getting and doing whatever he wants. Well, the Murdoch family is just a legendary name in that part of the world for 100 years. And essentially, we're the power brokers, not just in, in Hampton, but in the region for a very, very, very long time. After swaggering out of the bar, Paul is seen arguing with some of the five friends who've joined him for this night out on the water in his father's boat. To other members of the party, the gravity of the moment seems unclear. You see Mallory and Anthony, her boyfriend, you know, laughing, holding hands. It's, it's very poignant, because it almost gives me chills to think about, because you know you're watching the last moments of this young woman's life. It's tough to watch, honestly. Oh, what? Really? Nine, one, one, where's your emergency? We're in a boat crash on Arthur Street. There's, there's six of us, and one is missing. When authorities arrive, the missing girl's boyfriend, Anthony Cook, lets them know how unlikely it is that Paul, or any Murdoch, will ever face justice in this deadly incident. Y'all know Alec Murdoch? Oh, yeah, I know the name. That's his son. That's so driving the Good luck. Alec Murdoch may seem above the law to people who know him. But the death on his boat begins to shine a light on his family that could bring him down. You can see him sitting there and the walls start closing in because now he and his entire family was under a level of scrutiny that they had never, never experienced in the life of that family. In the months that follow his son's boat crash, an unprecedented tale of power and greed will be revealed. But it's got family drama. It's biblical. It's Shakespearean. It's, it's just everything.
Even the setting of the Murdoch's real-life Southern Gothic tale feels like something out of a novel. Well, Hampton County is in the what we call the low country. It's a, it is a different world in a very real sense. It's almost a trip back in time to Mayberry. The biggest building is Alec Murdoch's old law firm. Everyone knows what the firm is. For many years, there was never a sign out in front, and guess what? They're still not. It's not necessary. For almost nine decades, three generations of Murdoch served as prosecutors, also known as solicitors, over Hampton and four surrounding counties. The job makes them the main power brokers in the area. Justin Bamberg is an attorney who will represent many of Alec Murdoch's alleged victims. You didn't want to be on the, the other end of what they were working on or what they wanted. You know, I mean, they've run the 14th Circuit Solicitor's Office for 100 years, tapped in, tied in. That's law enforcement. That's EMS. That's all the people who could make your life difficult. It's a type of power that comes in handy at the personal injury law firm the Murdochs run in tandem with the solicitor's office. Valerie Borline is a Wall Street Journal reporter now writing a book about the Murdoch family. The solicitor gets to decide who gets prosecuted for a case. If you had a problem or run in with the law and you went to the Murdoch firm, they can make it go away sometimes, but then you owed them. According to attorney Justin Bamberg, the ability to decide how and when the law is enforced as solicitors gives the Murdochs a leg up at their private law firm when they try a case before a local jury. What do you think people are going to do? You go to pick your jury, and there's the mother of this boy who the solicitor's office could have dropped the hammer on and didn't because solicitor Murdoch looked out well, people are going to pay it forward. The cases came to the Murdoch law firm because if you had a personal injury lawsuit, you were going to win. And you were probably going to win more money than you would anywhere else. Stacy Keach here, feeling greedy for more videos like this one? Then be sure to like and subscribe right here on CNBC Prime.